start a brand new section. I just had this one last example that I did not get to cover with you guys uh, in class last week. We just ran out of time, so I thought we'd start with it today, and then we'd shift gears into that new lesson. Um, we talked last week uh, about options and between input and out. Uh, Quentin, you're back there rocking a sweet NASA hoodie. I like that hoodie, my man. Uh, I'm going to ask you my first question today. Quentin, what do we call the set of inputs? Remember what we call that? All those X values, they fit into the what? Starts with the letter D. Tisk, tisk. Let's see if Drew Benton can hook you up. The domain. Good. So if you look at this example here, the domain of our function is going to be the number of books printed. That's our input. That's our independent variable. All right, the word independent means input. In this case, so those are our X values. Or in this example, particularly the number of books that we're printing. OK, we got the Mossy Valentino printing company that we're rocking out today. OK, and Mossy's uh, number one head uh, head um, uh, uh, number cruncher comes to him and says, Mr. Valentino, uh, here is your cost function, sir. This is how much it's going to cost for you to do business. Uh, and that cost depends upon how many books you want to print, sir. So the dependent variable, those are our outcomes. Those are typically our Y values. Okay, in this case, it's going to be our C values since this function isn't Y equals, it's uh, uh, C, cost. So the cost is going to depend upon uh, how many books you print. Teddy, my son, like I said, he's got case testing today. His performance depends upon how much sleep he got, how much breakfast he eats, and how much he tries his best. So the, the performance is the dependent variable, and then those other things like breakfast and sleep, we know those are our independent variables. So you control those independently. All right, so, um, ooh, I've got typos here. I, I meant to fix this. Let's see, here's C and C, there we go. So um, looking at this function, what this means is that the cost is determined by uh, 3.25 times every book that he prints plus an additional 1500. Now that might be like overhead. That may, that, that might be like, hey, how much um, uh, it costs to, to rent the facility or to pay your number one number cruncher, uh, you know, or to, to, to whatever, keep the lights running. That's what's called overhead, okay? So that 1500, it, even if he doesn't print any books, Mossy still has that as a daily cost, 1500 bucks. Okay, facilities rental, facilities upkeep. Um, what does the 3.25 stand for? That stands for the cost of printing each book, right? So if you consider this is in the form y equals mx plus b, I'm going to mimic this. Look, y equals mx plus b, right? And we kind of think about what is that 3.25? That's the slope of our line, isn't it? And 1500 would be the y-intercept. So if, if we were to consider the graph of this, here's x and here's c, right? There's the point zero. What's the course? Uh, that second question right there. What is C of zero? What's the Y value when we're printing zero books? What's the outcome? What's the cost here? If you don't want to print anything, Jack, maybe. Yeah, 1500 bucks. That's how much it costs to run Mossy's printing company. And then that line would go up into the right. We really don't move it to the left because it's not like you can print negative books. So Quentin, what was that word again? I asked you about a minute ago. The domain here, we would say, uh, is is all of our, our whole numbers, right? Zero, one, two, three, because you're not going to print half a book, are you, Alex? So, so the idea here is that uh, C of zero means that that's the cost of printing zero books. So what do you think, Jack Candiato, what do you think C of a thousand would be? Like in words, not actual the number. If C of zero is the cost of printing zero books, C of a thousand would be the cost of printing a thousand books, right? And so the way that we would find that is we would say 3.25 times a thousand. This is that uh, evaluating, right? Where we would plug and chug. Okay. And so that's going to give us 3250 plus 1500. What is that? 4,750? That would be the cost of printing a thousand books. So if you had a thousand up here, 4,750 would be your cost, okay? Now, Mossy, <clears throat> here's where the uh, 
problem gets interesting. George is going to come to you. And George is going to say, Mossy, my man, uh, I've got a deal for you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a, uh, uh, a different facility over here that I would like to rent out. Um, and you know what? Your daily costs, uh, that's just too much. You're paying $1,500 a day to rent the current facility. You know what? I'll do it for half that. And so, so George is going to roll up in there and he's going to say, I've got this printing facility that you can use for $750 a day. And, and you say, hey, that sounds great. What's the catch? And so George says, you know, I, I charge a little bit more per book. Uh, when you print. So I would charge $4 per book. All right. Now, if you think about that, um, let me kind of zoom out here. If you think about George's offer, whoops, what that is like saying is that is like saying he's going to come in with a, with a different line. Okay. He's going to come in with a line. He's going to say, hey, if you print zero books, it costs 750. Uh, but but here here's my equation. Your cost would be 4x plus 750. So as a business owner, Andrew, what do you think Mossy's decision is going to have to be? He'll make it. He'll, he'll, use, he'll have to use less money for George's offer than for the other offer. All right, so in other words, which one's going to cost less? So graphically speaking or visually speaking, Will Edwards, what would we be looking for then? You see my blue and my orange graph? What would we be looking for there? Uh, All right, Grove, can you describe it? What, what are we looking for? There's something on that graph that I need you to help find it. All right, let me ask the question this way, fellas. When would it be cheaper to go with George's offer. When would the cost be lower, less than? Uh, sublet? OK, good. Say that again, that I word. The intersection right here, this black point, would be the point at which those two offers would be negligible. negligible. They'd, be, they'd be, you know, flip a coin. It doesn't matter. You can go with either one. That cost is the same. Everywhere up to that point, George's offer is better, right? It's got lower overhead, although it has a more expensive cost per book. As long as Mossy is not printing whatever this value is, as long as Mossy's not printing that many books, then of course it would make more sense to go with George's offer because that's cheaper. But if Mossy says, Dad, you know, I'm, I'm printing more than that books, he should stick with the blue offer because although, uh, you know, it costs more up front every day, uh, it's a cheaper amount per book. And so that's what our next chapter is going to go into. That that I word that Luke just mentioned, the intersection. And, and this is a real example in everyday life where you guys encounter this. I'll, I'll tell you, I've encountered this before. Um, you know, when you are, it's getting, it's getting cooler outside, right? So y'all are probably doing what at home? Turning on the old furnace, turning on the old heater, okay? How many of you guys know what kind of heating unit you've got at home? If I asked you natural gas or electric, would you be able to tell me? Anybody know? Oh, tisk tisk. Teddy Morgan, the nine-year-old, learned that this weekend. We were doing a Cub Scout project around the house called Fix It. And one of the things was he had to learn how to shut the water off to the house. He had to learn how to shut the electricity off to the house. He had to learn how to shut the gas off to the house. You know Memphis, MLG and W, what does MLGW stand for? Memphis light, gas, and water. Those are your three utilities. So you got to know how to shut those off in case of emergency, right? And so anyway, he was learning how to do this. And so one of the questions that it asked the little Weeble O Cub Scout boy was, uh, hey, what kind of furnace do you have? What kind of uh, HVAC unit are you using? Is it natural gas? Is it liquid propane? Is it electric? Blah, blah, blah. And so ours is natural gas. So our gas comes in from, uh, uh, from Somerville out near where we live. And, uh, you know, there's a very different cost breakdown for somebody like me that has a natural gas heating unit as opposed to somebody like, like let's pretend and say Tiago's got an electric heating unit, okay? Electric is way cheaper to put in. It's, it's, its initial cost would be lower. That's kind of like George's offer, the orange line. But it's higher per day of use. It's got a higher slope, doesn't it? So for me, it, it costs more to put in a natural gas unit, but it runs cheaper every day. 
Okay, so that's a real life decision where you guys are going to have to find what was that I word again? The intersection, that break even point, the point where you can flip a coin, it doesn't matter which offer you go with. And that's where you decide, oh, well, you know what? Okay, this makes more sense because we would just be in this range uh, or oh, we'd be out here. We need to go with the other one. Let's let's shift gears. You got to start yourself a brand new section here. Okay. And, you know, we'll save those for tomorrow. We're, we're rocking and rolling. We'll get into some examples now. Um, start yourself a brand new section. This is chapter four. Okay, Alex, chapter four is all about what are called, quote, quote, systems. And we're not talking about solar system. I love me some uh, very eager mothers and whatnot. Do y'all still learn it that way? My very eager mother just sat upon nine porcupines. I'm a holding out, baby. Pluto's still a planet in my book. You're telling me that you guys have never heard my very eager mother just sat upon nine porcupines? Gosh, dog it. James, y'all learned. What was your way, James? Just sent us nine pizzas? Dude, I like that. <sighs> Times are changing, boys. Times are changing. It's like eggs. Used to, they would say, eggs are good for you. And then they change and they say, eggs are bad. Cholesterol, boo, bad. And then they go back, eggs are good for you again. You know, they do the same daggum thing with Pluto. They're just teasing Pluto right now. They're like, yes, you're a planet. No, you're not a planet. Yes, you're a planet. No, you're not a planet. Make up your daggum mind. That's what I say. But we're not talking about solar systems. We're talking about systems of equations and inequalities. So a quote system here, what you need to understand is it's just basically where I'm going to give you a couple of equations, two, three equations at once. All right, I'm going to give you George's and Massey's equations. And I'm going to put them together in the same context. That's called a system. All right, you are a student. You're an individual student. When you come together as part of a class, you are now part of a system of students, so to speak. OK, you get it to where you can operate independently on your own. But when you come together as a class or a group or a unit, Right? You have things that you have in common. Maybe there are some commonalities, some intersection points, if you will. All right. So a system of equations, we're going to look at how to find the solution to a system of equations. And here's where I want the, the main crux of our focus to be on for the last uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes of class here. What it means to find the solution. We are looking for that point of intersection. We are looking for a point whose coordinates make a true statement in every equation. OK, most of the systems that y'all deal with in Algebra 1 will be what's called a two by two. A two by two system means that I give you two equations and in each of those equations there are two variables. Can you write that down for me, please? That you're going to deal with two by two systems, you know, a vast majority of the time. And a two by two system is one where there's two equations and each equation has two variables. That's a two by two. Use your imagination and tell me what do you think a three by three would be? Somebody holler it out. Three. Yeah, three equations and each of those equations would have three variables, maybe like an X and a Y and a Z or a four by four system. Oh, mama, that's where you're really getting into the algebra two realm. Uh, a four by four would be four equations with four variables, maybe like W, X, Y, and Z. OK, and uh, so we're, we're going to keep it simple in algebra one. We'll talk about two by twos and three by threes. OK, now a two by two system, two equations, two variables. If it has a solution, what that means is that it has a point or points whose coordinates kind of statement, a true statement in how many of the equations? All of them. That is super important. OK. So look at example one here. I'll give you a system. Both of those equations, by the way, uh, Paul, are in what form? We got x minus y equals negative one, and we got two x minus y equals negative five. What form are those in? Standard form indeed. All right. So we're asked the question, part A right here. Lewis Thomas, it says, is negative two, negative one a solution? What should I do to check that, Mr. Thomas? What do you think? Plug them in. Yeah, I'm going to plug in X equals negative two and Y equals negative one for both equations. And I want to see if they yield a true statement. So let's see. Negative two. Oops, I'm leaning on my keyboard. Negative two goes in for X. And Alex, you having trouble seeing? I'll raise it up a little bit, buddy. And negative one is going to go in for Y. And we want to see, does that equal the right hand side? At the same time, we want to see two times. OK, so X is negative two. Y is, oops, 
negative one. I want to see, does that equal negative five? All right. So really, this is just a matter of a little bit of arithmetic. We'll move part B down here just a little bit so we get that out of our way. All right, and I'm going to drag this down. Ah, good, we got more room now. Okay, so what do y'all think about negative two minus negative one? Is that equal to negative one? Does the first equation hold true? Yes, it does. Now, here's what that means. Because we've got winner, winner, chicken dinner on that first one, that means that the point negative two, negative one is on the line of that first equation. Because you got a true statement, we know that, that first equation, if we graphed it out, would pass through the line negative two, negative one. It would bear writing down again, I think, if I were you, that whenever I get a true statement from plug and chug, that means that that point is on the line whose equation is given. Okay. When I get a true statement from plugging in uh, negative two, negative one in this case into that first equation, that means that that point is on the first line. Now let's see if it gives us a true statement on the second equation. What do you think? Two times negative two would be negative four. Negative four minus negative one becomes plus positive one. <clears throat> That's negative three. So we would say, sorry, Charlie, it is not on that second line. So although the point negative two, negative one is on the first line, it's not on the second line. So what do we think? Is this a solution? Yeah. We would say no. Negative two, negative one is not a solution because it wasn't on both lines. It didn't make a true statement in both equations. All right. Now, when we look at point B, or, or point, point B, the second point right here, um, we plug in, plug and chug again, and we say negative four goes in for X. Negative three goes in for y. Uh, is that equal to negative one? I'll let you guys run the numbers. Two times negative four. Negative three goes in there. And we want to know, hey, is that equal to negative five? Well, let's see here. We got negative four minus negative three. So it's plus positive. What's negative four plus three? All right, that does equal negative one. So again, that means that this point, what, is on that first line. Okay, that's great. Hey, oh, look at you. You are so sweet. Thank you. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. What did they say? Is there water, water in orange? Lounge. In the lounge. Okay, thank you. All right. What about that second point, or that second equation, rather? What's two times negative four? Negative eight. And minus negative becomes plus positive. Oh, we've got a winner here. Okay, so it winds up. So what does that mean? That means that this point is on both of the lines, and therefore it is a solution to the equation. Okay. Now I want us to let's do a little. Uh, we'll use our imagination here. If if time was not a factor, of course we could go do this. But heck, y'all don't have all data to piddle around with all coach Morgan y'all got places to be but let's pretend like we walked outside right now and we went out there onto Walnut Grove and we started walking down the middle of the daggum street okay dodging traffic having fun oh it'd be grand wouldn't it okay Will's eyes just got real big and let's say we walk we're gonna walk west okay we're gonna walk west quite a bit and then we're gonna come go for you St. Louis guys that'd be getting close to y'all school we're gonna go down to to uh White Station okay so we're gonna be Walnut Grove Road, we're going to be walking west till we get to White Station. And then at White Station, we're going to sit out in the middle of the what? In the middle of the intersection. And I'm going to say, hey, guys, we're on Walnut Grove Road. And you all would say, yes, we are. And that's true, Coach Morgan, because we're in the middle of the intersection, right? And I'm going to say, hey, guys, we're on White Station Road. And you guys would say, yes, we are, because, again, we're on that intersection. We are on what? Both roads, okay? The point of intersection is the point on both lines, and therefore it would make a true statement, what I said was true, right, for both of those lines. So when we talk about the system of equations, 
there are three scenarios, graphically speaking, that, that we come across, okay? What I just described, okay? My dadgum highlights are off kilter. Hold on. What I just described is called a consistent system. All right. There's one point of intersection. Okay. A consistent system. I'm trying to fix my highlights here. A solution, one point in common. Uh, one, that's what I wanted. Okay, one solution. There we go. I don't know how that got off kilter. So when you've got what's called a consistent system, uh, fellas, that's like 90% of the systems that you encounter. There are two lines that they have a point of intersection, and your job is just to find the point of intersection, to find that solution. Okay. There's one solution to a consistent system. Those two lines, they intersect. They cross each other. That's plain Jane, good old-fashioned, just system of equations, find where they intersect. Nine times out of ten, that's what you'll encounter. Okay. There's another type of system called an inconsistent system. Y'all ever seen The Princess Bride? Y'all know that movie? Oh, I love The Princess Bride. If you haven't seen The Princess Bride, you're missing out. Um, but <laughs> there's a guy named Wallace Shawn that's an actor that plays this bad guy in that movie. And his line, he always says, inconceivable. You know, uh, <laughs> this is inconsistent. Lines do not intersect. Okay? They are what? P word. They are parallel. You see, fellas, oh, oh, who remembers something about parallel lines regarding what we've talked about uh, so far? Oh, go, go for it, Jack. I know you know. They never touch. Okay, that's true. I'm, I'm shooting more for like, what have we been discussing recently regarding lines and their characteristics? Paul? Paul's hand went halfway to the back of his head. I thought he was raising his hand. All right, Tiago? They've got the same slope. Good. So if you encounter a system where the equations have the hey Aiden, where the equations have the same slope those lines as jack said they don't touch each other they don't intersect they have no point of intersection therefore they have no what what have i highlighted here they've got no solution that's like if we got on walnut grove road uh half our class got on walnut grove road and the other half of the class got on poplar okay and just here in east memphis Poplar and Walnut Grove pretty much run parallel. Once you get on into Midtown, they do like this crazy switch, and then they go back and they continue being parallel. Walnut Grove switches its name also. It starts going by what? Y'all know what Walnut Grove is called when you get downtown? Union Avenue. It's in that song, Walking in Memphis, down on Union Avenue. Anyway, those lines are parallel. They don't intersect. They have no solution. And then the, this last one is kind of weird. This consistent, but it's called dependent. Write that word down. Dependent. Okay. So a dependent system is where it's actually the same line. It's just written different ways. Like, for example, um, y equals x plus 5 and 2y equals 2x plus 10. Those are the same exact equations. OK, those would be the same lines. So I'd be one line right on top of the other line. We call those lines they coincide. And how many points in common? How many common points of intersection do you think coinciding lines have? Infinite. Infinitely many. That's what I got highlighted right there. Infinitely many solutions. So if we get a, come across a dependent system, that's going to be where you say, ah, oh, Coach Morgan, you got infinitely many points of intersection. All right. Now, that doesn't mean that any point could work as a solution. Like in my little example right here, the point 0, 6, that is not a solution to that system. Okay, but what we would say is we would say, hey, there are infinitely many points of intersection on or, or for this system. You know, you can just go up and down the line all you want to all the live long day. So those three systems, okay, we need to be familiar with. Independent or consistent is what I call the, the one where there's just one solution most often. Inconsistent is where there's no solution. And then dependent is where there's infinitely many solutions. Right? And our job tomorrow, no, not tomorrow, pardon me, tomorrow's Wednesday. Our job Thursday is going to be coming in, and we're going to start graphing systems. In other words, we're just going to get back into that y equals mx plus b slope and, and your y-intercept. We're going to practice graphing, and we're going to say, hmm, did these cross? And if so, where? And that will be the solution that we find. Okay? 
You have any questions for me before I got to dismiss you? Well, wonderful job today, fellas. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a nice orderly dismissal. I don't want people congregating and bottlenecking at the door. So I'll say this to the guys at home, live Jesus in our hearts. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to log off. Everybody pack up, but don't everybody leave just yet. I want my first two rows right here uh, for you guys. I want you all to head on out. Yes, sir.